Good afternoon and welcome to the Washington Medical Commission patient focused webinar series. Today we are discussing how the WMC can help you, the patient. Today we have a panel of WMC experts, including Mr. John Malden, WMC Chair, Melanie DeLeon, Executive Director, Frida Pace, Director of Investigations, and Dr. April Jager, WMC Physician Member. Now, before I turn over the webinar, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. So look for the question box on your webinar portal and we'll do our best to address your questions toward the end of the presentation. We hope you don't have any technical difficulties, but if you do, look for the help button on the webinar portal to get your issue worked out. We are recording this webinar and the on-demand version and the slide deck will be available on our website within the next few days. Please feel free to share these resources with your colleagues. And lastly, we want our learning events to be as interactive as possible. So please feel free to use our social media platforms to share what you have learned and keep the conversation going. Now with all of that out of the way, I will turn over the webinar. So that's me. <clears throat> so what is the composition of the Medical Commission? The Commission actually has two parts. The um, administrative side has approximately 55 staff performing functions of, of licensing, investigations, legal issues, and so forth. The second part of the Medical Commission consists of 21 uh, commissioners, 13 of whom are physicians, 10 physicians represent uh, congressional districts, the other three are at large, meaning that they can come from anywhere in the state. There are also uh, two physician assistant members and six public members, all of whom are um, at large as well. One last Excellent. point, a big, a big point. <laughs> all commissioners are, are appointed by the governor for uh, a maximum of two terms, four years uh, uh, for each term. So the the Medical Commission has uh, a mission and a vision that you can find on our website. The purpose of the commission is to license and regulate physicians and physicians assistants who want to treat patients in Washington state. Now, there are two types of physicians. This was unknown to me until I really came on board and worked for the commission. There are allopathic physicians or MDs, and those are the physicians that re-regulate. And then there are osteopathic uh, physicians or DOs. And there is another medical board, the Board of Osteopathic Medicine um, and Surgery that, that regulates that board. So we are only going to be talking today about allopathic physicians and physician assistants. So the, the Medical Commission regulates physicians by establishing uh, qualifications to be licensed. We also, uh, the Commission ensures consistent standards of practice, and they require physicians and physician assistants to keep up their levels of competency through continuing education and training, and we monitor that. The Commission also um, develops rules, and rulemaking is a statutorily prescribed process by which the commission will um, interpret statutes that have been passed by the legislature and they will come up with rules on how to implement those statutes or how those statutes will be interpreted. An example of the rules that are passed by the commission would include the opioid prescribing rules and those were done several years ago. Um, and then you can look in um, the rules, it's called the Washington Administrative Code, uh, to see other rules that are uh, purported by the commission as well. They also develop policies regarding, for example, telemedicine or a physician's treatment of themselves or their family members. And those don't carry the weight of law or, or uh, a rule, but they are policies and they can be considered uh, when looking at the overall performance of a physician. They set uh, uh, standards and procedures on how to do business internally. Uh, they look at um, interpretive statements. For example, say the, the federal government comes out with something and the, the commission might want to set a, an interpretive statement to help physicians and PAs understand kind of what their thought was about this particular statute 
or rule. So they, they do a lot of things other than license physicians. And they also want to make sure that everybody gets uh, quality health care throughout uh, Washington. And that's where they uh, develop uh, standards of practice. And those you can all find those on our website. We have a whole section on rules, policies, and procedures. So if you're interested in knowing more about those, please go to our website, which is wmc.wa.gov. When a commissioner is appointed by the governor and they become a, a, a commissioner, they have to follow a code of conduct and a code of ethics as um, set forth in this slide. So each of them have to make sure that there's no conflict of interest between themselves and any kind of cases that they might work on. They, um, they vow to make fair and objective decisions. So if they know one of the uh, licensees who are coming under scrutiny, they would recuse themselves from having any kind of, of decision making um, in that particular case so that they, there wouldn't be a conflict of interest. And there's a whole set of ethics laws when a person becomes an appointed commissioner that you can find on, under the 4252, um, the Ethics and Public Service Act. So if you wanna see more about those, you can look those up. Again, you can look on our website and see the code of conduct and the code of ethics that the commissioners need to follow once they're appointed by the governor. Next slide, please. Um, excuse me. The uh, Medical Commission, as Melanie mentioned, uh, licenses all, all physicians and uh, physician assistants. The uh, Commission also has regulatory authority over uh, physicians and physicians assistants when, when care issues uh, are not within the standard of care. So the commission has the ability to restrict areas of, of practice temporarily or permanently if a physician appears to not have the competency in those particular areas, or the uh, commission can suspend or revoke a license um, for issues that may, may uh, include more egregious care issues or, or more egregious violations of the standard of care. It is commonly thought that the commission oversees other areas that Melanie mentioned osteopathic physicians. Of course, we do not uh, license uh, the, the uh, DOs. They have their own board, nurses, naturopaths, medical assistants, so forth. We often get complaints involving hospitals, which come on, comes under the title of facilities. Um, while we don't regulate hospitals, there could be hospital care issues along with MD issues. And in that case, each uh, jurisdiction would conduct their own investigation. We don't uh, regulate optometrists, but we do regulate ophthalmologists who are MDs. Next, next slide, please that there are a lot of resources on our website for patients. And if you go to our website, we have a button in the middle of the website, not a tab on the top, but a button that says uh, for the public. And if you click on that button, you will find resources and information tailored uh, to the public. And some of this information includes complaints and actions, and it walks you through how to file a complaint, You'll find our, we have an online complaint form that you can fill out and send to us, or you can download the, the complaint form and mail it to us if you so desire. It, there's a, uh, a section called how to get involved, and that includes a calendar of our meetings and uh, all of our um, policy meetings and our business meetings are open to the public. And right now they've all been virtual. So if you go onto the meetings calendar, you can see the link um, to join those and observe our policy committee uh, meetings. And you can even uh, talk about the policy and kind of put your two cents worth in as well. And then you can listen to our um, business meeting as well. 
um, anytime the commission makes a decision, all of those meetings are open to the public. So you can always find those on our meetings uh, calendar and they will have a link. Now, over the past two years, because of the pandemic, all of our meetings have been virtual. And once we transition back to being able to meet in person, we will still have the ability for a hybrid meeting. We have got all of the, um, the equipment so that during our public portions of our meetings, the policy meeting and the business meeting, we will have the ability for you to uh, click on a link and uh, come to those meetings virtually. So even though uh, the commission will transition eventually back to in-person meetings, we will still have that ability for, for the public to attend virtually. And lastly on that web uh, page is a, a, a section called resources. And on that uh, web page, you will see these two particular uh, resources that are provided on this slide, which is the patient toolkit and your bill of rights. And it would, might be uh, great for you to take a few minutes out of your day to read through those. Uh, there's a lot of information there for you as a patient. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, you can contact us through the website. Next slide, please. So the Medical Commission um, operates under the Uniform Disciplinary Act, that is uh, RCW Revised Code of Washington 18130080. And this slide uh, does list those uh, areas that we investigate and where we can investigate and where we cannot investigate. Issues that we can investigate include complaints where care was below the acceptable standard of care, uh, substance abuse complaints, inappropriate prescribing, whether that's overprescribing or underprescribing, um, allegations of sexual misconduct, uh, false advertisement, and fraud. There are some limitations with respect to fraud, but we do investigate those issues. Complaints that we cannot investigate, things of uh, such as long wait times, patient long wait times, billing disputes, um, which we'll talk about later in our presentation more specifically. Um, we do not investigate communication issues around rudeness and the last uh, errors in the medical records. So we will talk about medical records a little later in the presentation as well. Next slide, please. Issues that we do not investigate also include billing issues. Um, this comes up a lot, unfortunately, um, but we do not have jurisdiction over billing matters. Um, those complaints that we receive involving billing issues are referred. We provide uh, resources to complainants on how to uh, submit billing issues as far as where to go to um, obtain any additional support or, or help. And those entities are listed here on this slide, which include going to the hospital where the care was provided, the clinic or hospital, um, contacting your insurance company. Um, we also work collaboratively with the Office of Insurance Commission, uh, as well as Medicare, Medi Medicare, Medicaid, um, our Attorney General's Office. So we provide several resources to our patients and constituents that need help and support with dealing with the billing issues, but we do not investigate these issues. Next slide, please. How to obtain your medical records. Uh, this does come to our attention a lot. Uh, I know this is a common issue, but there are some limitations in terms of how we can help provide you resources and, and help in obtaining your medical records. Um, you, one of the things that we would like to encourage, um, most of which is available on our website as well, if you do uh, experience any issues obtaining your medical records, we strongly encourage you to contact your provider, um, your healthcare provider, and request in writing access to your patient records. And we encourage you to do that uh, via certified mail. That is one way to document it and be able to uh, validate your attempts that you have requested access to your medical records by sending it via certified mail. 
Now your provider does have an obligation to provide or respond to your request for access to your medical records within 15 working days. Um, and access to your medical records can be, the laws around the medical records um, are specified in this slide, which is under RCW 7002 and RCW 7002 Um 702080, the practitioners are legally obligated to make the, the medical records available to a patient within the 15 days allotted. And there are some situations where a provider can deny those requests, and that can be found in RCW 702090. Uh, I believe um, at the next slide. How to file a complaint. Um, there are a few ways and options that you can file a complaint. You can certainly, and we encourage you to visit our website online. You have the ability to submit your complaint electronically through our online uh, reporting system. You also have the option of submitting a written complaint and submitting it to our medical commission office. You can send it to our website, or I'm sorry, you can send it to our email address, which is medical dot complaints at wmc.gov. You can send that in a written format or you can submit a request to obtain a copy of a complaint form sent to your uh, home address. If you do submit a complaint to the Medical Commission, we strongly encourage you to identify the healthcare practitioner um, by which you are filing an official complaint on. So if you if you don't know the name of the provider or you're having issues identifying the provider, uh, you can obtain that information by going back to your medical records and referring to your medical records to identify the practitioner who uh, provided the care. Um, in your complaint, please identify and be specific as to what the issues are and provide a timeline of when the events of your, your care occurred. Um, and in your explanation, be as descriptive as you can be about the circumstances by which your, your, your allegations that you're, you're submitting your complaint on, be as detailed as you possibly can about the care uh, that's in question and you would like us to investigate or look further into. Is that my slide? Uh, why some complaints are not investigated. I think I mentioned earlier about the Uniform Disciplinary Act, the UDA is what we commonly refer to, um, as if your complaint deals with issues outside of that, we, we unfortunately cannot provide assistance. Um, there is not enough information in the complaint is another reason why we would not investigate a, a complaint. Uh, the comp provider was not clearly identified. We have uh, limitations when the provider is not clearly identified in, in investigating it further. Complaints against a profession other than MD or PA is another, another example of complaints that we cannot investigate. So we would not have jurisdiction over any other healthcare practitioner other than MDs or PA. Another area of concern is too much time has passed since the original incident occurred. So if it, if the incident occurred you know, 30 years ago, um, we would have some limitations in terms of investigating those, those issues or concerns. Any issues uh, has been resolved since the incident occurred and when the complaint was filed. Um, and the last one is a whistleblower waiver. We'll talk a little bit more about the whistleblower waiver, but we do need a whistleblower waiver in order to investigate uh, issues involving patients and that whistleblower waiver signed should be returned to us within 30 days. Okay, the Medical Commission does a lot of things but there are a number of things that the Commission cannot do. There are, are a number of uh, frequent complaints on issues that are outside of the scope of the regulatory body. Um, 
for instance, uh, the commission cannot assist a patient to sue a physician or physician assistant. This requires the patient. If you want to sue your physician, you need to um, you need to retain an attorney. We do not handle fee disputes between you and your physician and your, or your physician assistant. This is an issue between yourself, the docs, the, the physician assistants, your insurance, or possibly your insurance carrier. We don't. We, we have no authority to return any money you feel you are owed by virtue of perhaps paying fees to a physician. We uh, cannot get involved in disability compensation. We oftentimes get complaints about uh, workers' compensation disability payments or substantiating the the, uh, the claim. This uh, this work is totally within the jurisdiction of the workers' compensation. Um, division. Um, and obviously, uh, insurance reimbursement issues are between the patient and an insurance carrier. I think Frida also mentioned that communications issues typically are something that we do not investigate, particularly rudeness on the part of the physician or physician staff. And we also have uh, no jurisdiction over whether or not the medical record has uh, typos or there is miscommunication or charting that is either wrong or perceived to be wrong by the patient. Those are issues that need to be resolved by, by the patient with either the physician or the physician's institution. I was muted there. So whistleblower waivers, as I indicated earlier, you can submit your complaint online, which we encourage you to do, on your online complaint process. If you identify as a patient or a healthcare provider or a licensee, you will be filtered through a whistleblower waiver process. So we would encourage you, or that process is a requirement in terms of identifying as a whistleblower waiver. Um, the RCW stated here, 4370075, uh, requires that you identify as a, if you identify as a whistleblower waiver, you have to sign the waiver form, either releasing your identity or denying the release of your identity. We may not be able to investigate any cases without releasing the identity of the patient or a person filing the complaint if you deny the waiver. So we strongly encourage you that if you identify in these three categories, whether you're the patient or an employee where the, of the institution where the complaint occurred or you're a licensed healthcare professional, please complete the whistleblower waiver um, because we need that form signed in order to proceed with our investigation. Next slide. Slide is mine, I believe. So should I file a complaint against the hospital or the medical commission? I think I mentioned earlier that uh, we oftentimes get complaints that have been made against the hospitals for a variety of issues, and we have no jurisdiction over that particular facility. However, there are oftentimes um, issues uh, where there are overlapping concerns of care that may involve both hospital um, staff as well as uh, uh, a physician or physician assistant. I think I mentioned earlier that each jurisdiction would do their own investigations. Um, so common things that you want to make sure that you focus on the hospital obviously are um, emergency room issues, being timely seen or untimely seen, any personnel or uh, hospital staff issues, billing, COVID protocols, rude staff, uh, communications, uh, both written and verbal that come from the hospital. Surgical schedules are, are outside the scope of uh, the physicians are done and are performed by uh, hospital staff. And uh, bad food is not something that we can get involved in. Uh, 
those are complaints you need to register with facilities as well as a, a perceived or an actual dirty facility. Uh, things to think about when filing a complaint against a MD or a PA is that it needs to be directly related to the care that they are providing. Um, <clears throat> the other issue that we have that comes up during the complaint process is whether or not a, an MD or a PA is acting beyond their scope of licensure or whether an MD or PA is allowing staff to perform functions that require licensure. If you feel that you have been sexually assaulted by a provider, certainly you should report those immediately. This would also include um, um, what, what is perceived or may actually be an improper examination. If you feel that a provider um, has a substance use issue, whether it be alcohol or medication related, you should report that uh, immediately, um, not only to the, the clinic, but also uh, to the commission if it is indeed an issue of concern. Instance of a physical or verbal abuse. Um, again, we don't really get into communications issue, but if you are abused physically, certainly that is something that ought to be reported because that is outside the practice of medicine. So now we're going to walk through some of the frequently asked questions that we get on our website. And again, this is just a snippet of those questions. There may be more on the website or hopefully, you know, we've answered some of the ones that you might have in your mind. But if we don't, again, you can always contact us through our website at wmc.wa.gov. Next slide. So one of the questions we get quite often is, can uh, your healthcare provider refuse to give you copies of your medical records because you might have an outstanding balance? And the short answer is no. However, um, you can be charged legally under the statutes for copies of your records. So even though you may you know, owe something to the practitioner, they can't withhold your records, but they can charge you a, a, a fee for those. So just keep that in mind. Next slide. So can, can I make a complaint without giving my name? Of course, you can do that. Yes, you can submit a complaint without releasing your identity. However, it does limit to some degree our ability to investigate further. So complaints that do not include the name of the patient or persons involved are difficult for us to investigate. So your identity may be, ne be necessary in order to answer questions about the care that you were provided or was not provided by the physician or the physician's assistants or any witnesses and to secure your medical records if they are needed for the investigation. So in the event, you would be asked to complete a release of confidentiality and would be given the necessary information to make a decision. Another question we get is, can the medical commission send a physician or PA to jail? No, <laughs> we don't. We're an administrative regulatory agency. We are not, uh, we do not do anything having to do with crimes that would be left to law enforcement. Um, so we don't have the authority to invoke any kind of jail time. And our sanctions usually include um, requiring additional training for a practitioner in a specific area, perhaps paying a fine or restitution for, for things that have happened that we have um, investigated. We might um, require the practitioner to get some sort of an evaluation if we think there are any kinds of issues keeping them from being able to practice within reasonable scale. Um, we might have the practitioner present a paper to their practice group regarding the issue. Um, and we always require the practitioner to once and talk to people um, who set the, the sanctions in place for this practitioner and kind of walk through 
what they learned with training or writing this paper has uh, been for them. So we, we do have that, but we cannot send um, practitioners to jail. So is there a time limit to file a complaint? Um, there is no time limit. There is no real statute of limitations and lawyer speak. However, it's a good idea to you know, file the complaint as close as possible to the incident because it's fresh in your mind. We can act upon it quickly. The witnesses will still remember what happened. The documentation is fresh. So we do ask that while there's no time limit, please file your complaint as close as possible to the incident. It just gives uh, us a better um, way to investigate it. The facts are remembered. And again, the witnesses, you know, memories have not lapsed. So again, no time limit, but please as quickly as possible is best. Mr. Malden, this is yours. Remember that. <laughs> Um, can, can a physician potentially fire a doctor? And yes, they can. Normally, um, it, it involves lack of communications issues between patients and physicians, or a patient could be non-compliant, and at that time the doctor might feel that um, lack of communications or ability to have a patient follow good medical advice is impaired for whatever reason and suggests that they may um, want to seek another physician for further care. There is a process uh, in place in order to uh, discharge a patient from care. It requires that the provider provide, provide 30 days of emergency care and this uh, notification needs to be in written form. Good idea for the provider to send that certified mail so that the patient is, uh, uh, is aware, is, uh, so that the provider, I guess, is aware the patient has received the notification. Optionally, uh, physicians can make a referral to another physician, normally done with the consent of a referring physician. And uh, another thing that a, a provider might do is refer, refer a patient to the local medical society uh, that may have a list of providers who are accepting new patients. So the question is, what part would you play as the complainant or the patient after filing a complaint? And you really don't have a continuing role once you file the complaint. Then the complaint gets assigned to an investigator if it's authorized for an investigation by a panel of commissioners. The investigator may contact you um, to get information, to fill out any kind of gaps in the complaint information, to kind of understand what the allegations are. Uh, first, of course, you would have to sign a release to waive your right to confidentiality. And Frida talked about those waivers because we may not be able to investigate the allegations that you provide in the complaint without letting the practitioner know your name because we're going to ask for your records if it's a standard of care issue. So you would need to, to waive your right to confidentiality. But after that, you have no role in the investigation. You're not what we call a party to the action. Um, that would between the, is between the medical commission and the practitioner. Those are the parties in the action. We will keep you abreast of information about the complaint. If there's a hearing, you may need to testify and provide information at that hearing. Of course, we would contact you about that well in advance because our hearings are usually scheduled at least six to eight months out in the calendar. And then we would notify you of the final decision of that, the, that is made by the commission. Sometimes after an investigation, the case will go to a panel, they'll discuss the investigation, and they will close the complaint without taking any further action. And we would let you know that at that point in time, you have the right to ask for the commission to reconsider their decision. It does require that you take steps to actually notify us within a 30-day window and say you would like 
a reconsideration of the co of the commission's complaint. If after that review of the complaint, the commission decides to take action, then we would notify you what that action is and that the um, the complaint has been closed pending you know this disciplinary action by the commission. And sometimes the commission and practitioner can come to an agreed stipulation. And sometimes they can come to an agreed order, but if not, and we have a statement of charges, again, we might go through an administrative hearing, and again, you might um, have to testify. But that's usually very rare and rare instances. And so normally, you don't have to do anything uh, for the hearing, and we notify you when it's over. And that can take a fair amount of time, again, because we, we use a health law judge who has to uh, draft the final order and they do this for 84 other professions and so it's not a very quick um, process so we do ask for your patience and grace while we process that next slide so i hope everyone will join me in a virtual round of applause for our panel um Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to use the question um, box and I will read them off. But while we are giving everyone a moment to kind of gather their thoughts, I do wanna remind our audience that we do have other upcoming webinars um, regarding your rights and needs as a patient. Um, upcoming on March 1st, we have Healthcare 101, How to Be an Informed Patient. And on March 15th, we have uh, a presentation called Your Rights as a Patient. So follow us on social media to learn about um, other additional webinars as they are announced. And you can learn more about the learning objectives of each webinar and registration on our website. So I'm going to give everyone a couple more minutes or just another minute to type in your questions. You can also use the chat function. Um, if you're having trouble using the question module, you can raise your hand and I can unmute you. But while we're waiting, is there anything else the panel would like to reinforce? Well, I'll just say that um... Knowledge about the medical commission is very sparse, especially in in with with patients and the public. And so, if you uh, can tell folks about the commission and what our role is in in healthcare and um, making sure that you get quality healthcare, we would appreciate it. If there are any questions that we didn't answer and you think about them next week, you know, contact us through the medical commission. We have an active social media um, platform as well as Twitter. And so we are always open to um, answering questions and finding out you know, what do you need from us as a patient? So I really hope that this spurs some conversation with you and other people and you will let them know of our existence um, because we are here to, uh, to help. I would only add that while the mission statement uh, states a number of things, the primary purpose of the medical commission is to protect the public. And we are a public agency, we're available, and uh, patients should be, should feel free to take advantage of the services of the medical commission if they have an issue with their providers. Well, you guys did a fantastic job because we don't have any questions, but it, like Melanie said, if you think of something later, please feel free to email us or reach out via social media. Um, and I hope everyone will join us for our upcoming webinars again on March 1st and March 15th. More information can be found on our website. And um, I just want to thank everyone for joining and participating and take care of yourselves. Thank you so much. <laughs>